So I want to shift into the second part of uh, my talk, uh, thinking really about shifting our perspective from one that is a food aid perspective to more a food sovereignty perspective. And here I think we have some encouraging movements uh, that are both top-down and grassroots. And I'll start with the top-down movement, and that's the uh, United Nations Right to Food movement. Um, so here's a statement of what uh, the Right to Food movement aims to achieve. Uh, we had uh, here at Berkeley Olivier de Schuter as our visiting scholar a few years ago. He um, is really the architect of, um, in many ways, of this Right to Food movement. Um, the Right to Food movement primarily aims to guarantee to each person, individually or as part of a group, permanent and secure access to diets that are adequate from the nutritional point of view, sustainably produced, and culturally acceptable. The right to food is closely related to the right of access to resources such as land, water, forests, and seeds that are essential to those who produce food for their own consumption. So the right to food movement is a um, com combination of governments working with human rights institutions and civil society along with social movements. And um, it's had some notable accomplishments. 25 countries now explicitly stipulate the right to food in their constitutions. And additional countries include right to food in their various policies. And so what this uh, does is it addresses root causes of hunger and malnutrition by providing legal backing. In other words, uh, and a quote from uh, some of Olivier's work, victims of violations are entitled to adequate reparation, which may take the form of restitution, compensation, satisfaction, or guarantees of non-repetition. So the idea is to really create a legal basis for people having uh, the ability to, the, the right not only to food, but also the right to produce uh, the food that they need. So it's a move away from food aid towards self-sufficiency. And then on the, from the bottom up side, our social movements, uh, the food sovereignty movement in particular, La Via Campesina, uh, is a global people's coalition that seeks a radical change to the global food system. And uh, their definition of food sovereignty, food sovereignty is people's right to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural system. It puts those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than the, the demands of markets and corporations. And I think that is the critical piece here. The food sovereignty movement is a very broad um, worldwide movement of, um, of uh, growers and peasants uh, around the world. And uh, they, they, are, they have uh, many different kinds of actions. They've sought land reform and accomplished land reform. They've converted uh, lands from industrial to agroecological farming. They've uh, challenged transnational corporations and the World Trade Organization. They've set up uh, programs of farmer-to-farmer -farmer training in agroecology, seed-saving networks, and other things. And so I think that they're very effective. So between this, these bottom-up movements and many other bottom-up movements as well, um, including local food uh, policy, um, food policy councils and uh, regional food initiatives, we have, I think, a move towards food sovereignty that is happening and that is also uh, gaining strength through the, these legal mechanisms from the top down. So both the right to food movements and the food sovereignty movement endorse agroecology as a key approach for achieving food sovereignty. So I want to talk now about um, shifting perspectives, moving from industrial agriculture to agroecology. And what um, is really appropriate about uh, agroecology for uh, the right to food and food sovereignty movements is that agroecological methods are, tend to be low technology and low cost but they're very knowledge and labor intensive. So um, they're very uh, appropriate, for example, for developing economies where there's often lots of labor um, and not lots of technology uh, and not lots of money to purchase inputs. Um, agroecological methods can really improve on the sustainability of farming systems and they can also greatly improve on productivity 
compared to uh, subsistence methods. So when they replace subsistence methods, they can really improve productivity, as well as stacking up pretty well and, and sometimes better than our conventional agricultural systems. So agroecological methods create what I like to think of as diversified farming systems. And I think it's this diversification that is really the key to the sustainability that's inherent in agroecological methods. We can think about the many techniques that agroecological methods use as being arrayed from um, along scales from plot to field to landscape scale. And I'm sure you've heard um, from some of the farmers who were spoke in the class earlier about some of these different methods. Um, so at the plot scale, we, we have things like composting and no-till agriculture, intercropping, uh, that's sort of within the field. Uh, we might add strips of flowers that are there just really to support beneficial insects. Um, rotating crops um, or cover cropping occurs at the whole field scale and is very important to diversify across time. Um, we might have hedgerows um, and uh, hedgerows around the, the fields that uh, support beneficial insects. Um, and we might have uh, uh, riverine areas or riparian areas that have forest around them. Uh, and we might have natural habitat. So from plot to field to landscape scale, these kinds of build up in scale. And they're important in terms of providing uh, and supporting key inputs to agriculture, nutrients, water, soil fertility, pest control, and pollination. And so if we just look uh, as an example at the plot scale, how this can happen. So uh, compost and no-till agriculture together help to provide an environment, a habitat that builds the soil's microbiota, microbiome, and also um, biota, so all kinds of different organisms are living in the soil, and creates that soil fertility. At the same time, having all that compost in there um, is organic matter that serves as this huge sponge that soaks up water, provides a lot of resilience in times of drought, uh, and meets the water out to plants. So all of these three important components here. Our intercropping here is uh, important because it supports beneficial insects like um, pollinators and also natural enemies of crop pests. And uh, it does this by providing different floral resources across time and also by reducing the concentration of resources that attracts specialist pests. So here we have this one, these, this, uh, these set of techniques at the plot scale that have so many important ramifications for the agricultural system. And when you think about it, pretty much all of these techniques are positively supporting multiple um, uh, components of the agricultural system, mo multiple inputs, if you will, to the agricultural system or multiple ecosystem services. And they're doing that by supporting the underlying agrobiodiversity. And it's a regenerative sort of system. They support this underlying agrobiodiversity, which provides the services that are needed in the agricultural, uh, in the agricultural system so the agricultural system can be productive. So here's what a diversified farming system might look like. Uh, you know, you have smaller fields, um, different types of things being planted, row crops and mixed crops and orchards. Uh, you have some uh, hedgerows around the fields. You have some riparian buffers. You have uh, meadows with livestock and you have some natural areas here. So all the different elements of, from plot to field to landscape scale are part of this diversified farming system. I was uh, explaining this to, uh, in a talk I gave about pollinators to the California State Board of Agriculture, and I showed this picture. And at the end, in the question and answer session, one of the growers said, that's a farm where we'd all like to live, which I thought was a really neat comment because it, it suggests that uh, this is a good place for people as well as for agriculture. Um, and you know, there's an aesthetic and cultural um, appeal to this farm as well. And somehow hidden in his comment was, that's the farm where we'd all like to live, but we don't all live on that farm. That's not the way our farming system is. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get there? So instead, we don't live on that farm. We have uh, really changed uh, the dominant model of, industrial, of industrialized agriculture is really a monoculture landscape. It's not that diversified landscape at all. Uh, and when that happens, it breaks these links 
between the agricultural system and all of these key inputs. And that means that instead, we have to essentially replace the ecosystem services that were being generated by that system and regenerated by that system, uh, which really is the, the essence of sustainability. And we have to replace them. So th we, we need these chemical fertilizers uh, that depend on uh, fossil fuels to be produced. Uh, we, we're going to substitute all that water use efficiency and water storage by groundwater pumping and irrigation. And we're going to get into deep problems with the groundwater pumping. Um, we're going to substitute those uh, pest control services with pesticides, again, fossil fuel dependent, create lots of toxins. And we're going to substitute those natural pollination services with, uh, with honeybees that we, we import um, into the field. Um, and uh, we do produce a lot of food this way, as we've talked about earlier today. Um, but the problem is, is that we also produce a lot of negative externalities, things that we don't want, um, pe from pesticide poisoning to lowered water tables to biodiversity loss, poverty, malnutrition, obesity, conflict.